Hello, so here we are with the first exclusive post for patrons on Patreon. Uh, as I promised in my announcement blog that you guys will get a reward for being a patron and here we are. But before we talk about this uh, post, I'll just quickly talk about TFIR. As you may have already read in the announcement post that uh, TFIR is all about the, the role open source is going to play in the ongoing uh, fourth industrial revolution. So many amazing things are happening. I, I can't tell you, I, I travel around the globe, I meet a lot of people, and all those stories will be published in TFIR. Uh, it's so much excitement is going on. So many new technologies are coming up that it's, it's, it's mind boggling. It, it's going to reshape our world. You would have not imagined what the world is going to look like in 10 or 20 years from now. And the most interesting thing for me is that open source is at the bedrock of this revolution that is going to happen. And, and I'm excited that I'm going to cover it. I'm going to talk about it in TFIR. And hopefully with your help, uh, I will continue to kind of, you know, we will walk together on this journey without having to worry about uh, editorial pressure from other publications who don't have the same focus or without worrying about the focus of advertisers who don't want to talk about certain topics, who want to talk about their markets. So I hope that, you know, this patron will help me in continuing with this journey which I have been doing for the last 12 years. So I would like to thank you all for being a patron and I would uh, really appreciate if you can share with your friends who are interested in open source and how you know it's going to change our world. Uh, now without further ado let's uh, introduce you to today's uh, exclusive post. It's, uh, it's an interview with uh, Linus Torvalds himself. The interview was conducted a few months back when I met him in person. Uh, but I was saving this audio version for some spe special occasion. The, the text version of this interview was published in Linux Pro Magazine, but I was saving this audio version. I wish, I wish I did a video interview, but hopefully I'll be meeting him again at the upcoming Open Source Summit, and that's when I would like uh, try to uh, do a video interview of Linux. In this interview, he talked about a lot of things you may have never heard of. Uh, it was a uh, more than a, an hour long interview, but I chopped a lot of parts. Uh, to, to make it shorter so that you can enjoy it. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure that you will enjoy all those things that he said in that uh, interview. This interview also shows that what kind of content you should expect from this channel. Uh, you will be getting very high quality, very high end, higher level of stuff here on TFIR. Uh, so this is my first post and the next post will be again about some major figure from the open source world. So just uh, keep an eye on it. And uh, all I can say is thank you for being a patron and uh, keep doing the nice work, keep supporting each other. And that's how we do things. And once again, thanks. And just don't forget to share this, uh, this uh, patron page with your friends and colleagues who do like to support the people who are doing open source. So thanks, now enjoy this video. So uh, now uh, Linux is uh, going to celebrate 25th anniversary, mm -hmm. right? And it was a very humble beginning. You sent out a mail that it will be a small non-professional project. Yeah, it's not even clear what the real anniversary date is. There's really two of them. Yeah, they have two. Well, there's the, so the August 25th one is the email, mm -hmm. which is the first public announcement, but it wasn't actually when the, I, I emailed that I will be announcing it. Okay. And then the 0 0.101 release was like two weeks later. Okay. And I don't, that one never actually got announced publicly at all. So okay. there's no email okay. for so that okay. one. But when did you start work? I mean, when was the first like code ready? Because that would be like, you know, um, it's more like this, you know, the, the biggest I, I don't even remember exactly when the, the kind of coding started, but it must have been roughly March or April. Okay. Uh, I got my machine that was the first Linux machine was I got it in in January mm -hmm. but at that point I had no idea that I needed to <laughs> write my own uh -huh. uh, OS and then it took a few months to get Minix set up and uh, from there it took me some time to realize that I needed to do my own thing mm -hmm. and uh, so I think I started coding maybe in April Mm -hmm. Okay. So it might be more than 25, uh, or it is clearly more than 25 years ago now. As my son it, says, I'm three and a half, so. <laughs> yeah. It's a, yeah, no, it's a long time. <laughs> yeah, yes. 
So, so when you look back, you know, in 35 years now, Linux is like almost everywhere. So when you look at that humble project you just wanted to do, you know, you, the mail yeah. you send out. So when you reflect back, if you, do you ever like look back and see, you know, how far it has come and what it has achieved in all this? Not years? really, no. No, I mean, if anything, because of the whole 25 year thing, and I've talked to journalists mainly over email. Uh, one of the things I reacted to when when I kind of got that question mm -hmm. was that v so much else in my life has changed, mm -hmm. and in many ways Linux has stayed the same. I mean, the details of Linux has changed completely. Mm -hmm. The fact that I mean, the kind of machines it runs on, the number of people involved, the companies involved, right? That has changed dramatically. But at the same time, for me. Uh, what hasn't really changed is the fact that, I mean, even 25 years ago, the reason I did Linux mm -hmm. was the interaction with the hardware and just exploring it and the technical interest. And while the details have changed and now I don't write any code anymore mm -hmm. and now it's mostly about directing people, mm -hmm. The the basics the the really core basics are still the same. The mm -hmm. thing I'm interested in tends to be the close interaction with the hardware, uh, the technical challenges. Uh, so, in a very real sense, Linux has changed much less than everything else around it. I mean, the fact that in the last twenty five years I now have three almost grown children, right, right? and. Uh, and I moved from Finland to the U.S. Mm -hmm. I went from being a university student to working at a startup to working at Linux Foundation. So everything else has changed so much. And at the same time, the reason I'm doing Linux has not changed at all. Mm -hmm. Right. But back in those days, as you said, you know, you had a new hardware, you want to do something. So now do you have the same image to scratch? Because now most of the hardware comes to print. No. So that, that has changed. The So... It used to be, but not for very long, actually. I mean, it used to be that I wrote Linux because it was something I needed. But that stopped very early on. Uh, and uh, I really think that if it hadn't been for then other people coming in and saying, I need this, or I think it should do this, I would probably have been done mm -hmm. by, like, end of 91, mm -hmm. where where I just remember that at that point it was doing kind of what I had mm -hmm. expected it to do but before that before I ever reached that point because I made it available and, and had other people come in and say hey okay for just as an example very early on my machine had four megabytes of RAM which is I mean that's <laughs> ridiculously little right, right. But it was plenty for what I was doing, and uh, and GCC at that point didn't actually need that mm -hmm. much. And somebody had a machine with two megabytes of RAM, mm -hmm. and it was he could not compile the kernel under Linux because that was not enough for GCC. And this was like around Christmas '91. Mm -hmm. um, I started working on paging to disk so that this guy with two megs of RAM could mm -hmm. could actually build his system on it. And uh, so literally in late 91, I was implementing major features that I felt I didn't actually need mm -hmm. because somebody else was, uh, was yeah. asking for it. Uh, so from very early on, my, the motivation for doing Linux went from this is something I need to, hey, other people are using it, mm -hmm. right? So this is not something, it, it changed, but it changed so early that I think of this as this is how I do Linux, right. is, is that the, the things people ask for really come from outside. Right. Yeah. 
And so that's that's not new to me anymore. Right. Yeah, I, right. earlier you know you told me in an interview you know that it's not just uh, the code sharing, but also your vision. You know, p- different people come yeah. to their own vision, yeah. did their own thing, and uh, and uh, that's what made made it much more interesting. Every that's single. That's going to be the yeah. second question. You know that yeah. uh, Linux, you know, it has uh, made companies comfortable with open source. I mean, you yeah. you can yeah. or not k- take credit, but the most important thing is that uh, as you said, you know, people can do their own thing, their own vision yeah. instead of you, you know, telling them what. So. <laughs> the, what makes you makes development so unique? I mean, your style, the way you look at it, well, the way you develop it. I mean, I think one of the issues was that I, uh, some other projects start with a very, uh, like they have a vision of where they want to go, and Linux never really had mm-hmm. that. I mean, Linux didn't even start right. as an operating system, mm-hmm. and and that meant that from the very first day after I made, like when people started making comments, I. I think I was more open than a lot of other projects to to their kind, mm-hmm. to just taking input from other people. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you looked at, like, in the, the time frame 25 years ago, uh, the other big operating system project was obviously the BSDs, right? Mm-hmm. But they had they had literally 20 years of history behind yes. them. They had people who who knew how things were supposed to be done and and Linux was way Linux didn't have that because right. I didn't have that mm-hmm. right so Linux was a project that was much more open to to just saying hey okay mm-hmm. we'll do that and it was much easier in initially individuals but later obviously mm-hmm. companies that mm-hmm. just wanted to push Linux in in the wrong direction and and because I didn't have any particular like goals in mind, mm-hmm. I was perfectly happy with that. Yeah, I mean, the only goal I have, and uh, that's still the case, that you can do whatever you want with Linux, but let's just make sure that the technicals right. like are good. So yeah, that's what going to be interesting. What are the compromises that you are willing to make and right. you're not willing to make? Right. So I mean, the 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 things I tend to care about is. If you're doing a driver, let's just get it working. A driver does not impact the the kind of big picture development and does not impact maintainability in the long run. Mm-hmm. One driver may be really ugly, but I'm very happy to get code like that merged into the kernel. Usually it comes through like Greg, if yeah. you should interview Greg, I be, uh, like, like through his staging three. Mm-hmm. And some of those drivers are really ugly and doing a lot of bad things. And that's fine. Mm-hmm. If they don't impact any other driver, mm-hmm. we can fix them up. Right, but when it comes to really core, like very like core kernel stuff, I do want to make sure that there's a clean design, that mm-hmm. there's a like a point that it's maintainable in the long run. Partly because the code is well written, but partly also because you kind of have a notion of where hardware is mm-hmm. going and where usage is going. Mm-hmm. So you have to pick something where where the interfaces work for different hardware and where the interfaces work well for different loads mm-hmm. because different people will use Linux for so different things. So that's where I I don't have uh, strong opinions on what you do with Linux, but I do have very strong opinions on the technical side and making sure the really core stuff is is well set up so that we don't paint ourselves in a, into a corner. Microsoft has changed so much in all this year. Uh, now they're using Linux for their own Azure. Uh, yeah. People quote you and all of things like, did you ever say that, you know, if Microsoft ever wrote an application for Win- Linux, I won, something like that? I, yeah, I do. I th- do think, I mean, you have to realize that back in, like, the late 90s, mm-hmm. The situation was very, very different, right. and and we in the Unix camp we used to make jokes about Windows crashing. Yeah. We used to, uh, which I mean, it, <laughs> well, it's gotten much better uh-huh. apparently. Uh, not that I've used Windows for long. I have long a VM okay. and I rarely use it because uh, yeah. most of the time it's updating. It takes twenty minutes uh-huh. to update. Well, so. Um, I think the situation just has changed. It used to be that it was a very antagonistic Mm -hmm. uh, situation where uh, partly because Microsoft used to be so dominant, right, right, that they were the target for a lot of antagonism. And I I used to make jokes about Mm -hmm. Microsoft, and I actually stopped doing that sometime during 
Like yeah, I mean, yeah, it's yeah. it's been maybe 15 years ago or something. But it used to be very common. It used to be very much a Microsoft versus like Linux and right. Microsoft well, versus so Unix. And pro, yeah, and and uh, and one of the reasons I stopped making Microsoft jokes was that it always generated all this. Unnecessary. Uh, uh, yeah, and uh, there was uh, there were stories written about Linux versus Microsoft, right, right. and that was never actually yeah, to me. That was yeah, right, right. It was it was more like it was a cheap joke to right. make a joke about Microsoft, but at the same time, I didn't care, and mm -hmm. it wasn't why I did Linux. And uh, Microsoft was mostly fairly neutral on Linux, except with obviously there mm -hmm. there were a few outbursts right. from Microsoft that were mm -hmm. uh, bad. It seems to really. They do seem to have changed in the last mm -hmm. couple of years. Right. So and with the new leadership change, I interviewed Sam Rand, you know, he played a big role in open yeah, source. Yeah. So you talk about. So it, I mean, there is like my different levels in the company. So, and founders, I think, tend to be more caring about baby, whether it's Bill Gates or Steve Ballmer or you know Larry Ellison, you know, or Steve Jobs. Yeah. Like it's totally different. Apple uh, from the time of Steve Jobs, who are just mm -hmm. suing everybody, and now. Tim Cook doesn't much care about it. So, so yeah. when you look at you know, uh, 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 if you did say that you know, if Microsoft ever wrote an app for Linux, and now PowerShell is there, Microsoft is using Linux. So, so what do you think? You know, is, is it the, the whole transformation of Microsoft? You know, I mean, you have actually touched upon that a bit. I, re I really don't. I, I, I don't really follow it. Though. I, I think it's more. I don't think it's even so much about Microsoft. I think the computing market and the operating system market in general has kind of, uh, it has matured to some yeah. degree. And, the, and the situation is different. Right. Right. And there are two markets, one is desktop, which is totally passionate people. It, it's, it's it, well, it's yeah. three, yeah. because there's also the mobile side, yeah. right? And w I mean, so I mean, Microsoft is not a player there, right. but, but, uh, but it's, it's such a different situation than it was uh, 20 years ago. I mean, is it a refreshing good change? It's a good thing. Uh, yeah, no, I, I, I think if, if you just look I at I mean, if you look at Microsoft, what Microsoft, you would want a hostile Microsoft or friendly Microsoft, which is embracing Linux, you know, working on Linux users. Yeah, yeah no, I, I, I think getting rid of the hostility. And, but it, it, I'm, what I'm trying to say is that it's actually, I think it's across the whole board. Mm -hmm. uh, tech companies used to be much more hostile to each other mm -hmm. and you had the sun versus microsoft wars right, and right. you it was really i don't think a very nice mm -hmm. marketplace and there's still hostilities and you yeah. still have like right. the google oracle thing going on and things like that mm -hmm. but I, I i think the market has kind of calmed down and people are are yeah, not quite so antagonistic anymore. They used to be, yeah. yeah. And so, uh, as a the desktop users, you know, get tend to get so passionate. Is it okay as, uh, for a Linux desktop user to use Windows app or Microsoft app on your on your de your desktop? I uh, I remember back when before we had good applications for doing presentations. Very early on, I was doing presentations about Linux, and I would actually use uh, PowerPoint on Wabi. Mm -hmm. the before Wine, mm -hmm. uh, Wabi was uh, Sun Microsystems mm -hmm. Windows emulator. Right. So I would actually run PowerPoint on Linux back in 95 or something like that. Oh. Is, is that the reason you don't do presentations anymore? Because there are no. <laughs> no, 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 no. I'm, the, I, I, I'm happy that I. It was only for a short while. I actually used PowerPoint, but, but it was. I, I don't. I've always felt that. I mean, if you look at the whole me versus Richard Stallman, mm -hmm. to me, the whole open source has not been about how commercial software is evil. Mm -hmm. To me, open source has always been about how I think it's a much better way of doing development. Right. Um, I think it's more productive when you cut through all the bullshit and, and the borders between companies and you can just work together with other people. Mm -hmm. And it's obviously why it's so much more fun, too, right. because you can just, you don't have to worry about who you're talking to, and you can just take input from anybody who has a good idea. So I think open source is a just a technically much better way of doing things. Mm -hmm. 
and and uh, I think the licensing is important, but I think it's uh, important as a way to to keep everybody honest and and keep open source open, and that's great. But it's never been this religious war for me that it is for some people. So um, so when when Oracle started porting their database when when there a lot of big companies came in and started making proprietary programs for Linux I was like that's great right it's just a platform like any yeah. other you know you should be actually you should be able to run whatever it yeah. is yeah yeah and at the same time I do think that open source is because it's a better way of doing things it tends to to take over especially the yeah. infrastructure part it's all so good, so I I Somebody who's doing a database that isn't open source, I would be worried about that mm -hmm. uh, in the long run, just right. because it's it's such a like infrastructure play. Right. Everybody needs it. MySQL obviously already took a lot of it. There are other open source databases. Right. So, in in the kind of really core infrastructure play. Mm -hmm. I think it's actually in the long run open source will take over, mm -hmm. but I don't think it's because of ideological reasons. It's I think it's technical and practical reasons. Yeah, I yeah. Mean, yeah. Uh, uh, Jim uh, Writers, the CEO of Red Hat, he was talking yeah. about the fourth industrial revolution, which is around AI and uh, mm -hmm. machine learning, and that's all. I mean, uh, everybody's open sourcing their stuff. Well, I mean, but if you actually look back at that historically, mm -hmm. basic applications used to be maybe not exactly open source because they weren't conscious about it. But if you look at original, like uh, how software programming was done mm -hmm. in the very early days, people would just ship tapes, yes, right. tapes to each other and mm -hmm. stuff like that. So almost always, when you're doing something completely new mm -hmm. and uh, the market doesn't really exist. Mm -hmm it's very natural to share anyway. Right. And and then when the market becomes bigger and economics take over, then the sharing often stops. Mm -hmm. And that's where a good license that, I mean, this is like what Corey Doctorow was saying, Doctor, yeah. that, that having a license that is basically, it has it, it, the openness cannot go away is actually important because it means that when a project grows up and grows from being uh, something experimental and fun to work with and becomes a big commercial thing, if you pick the right license, it will stay open and actually it will grow. So, uh, uh, I mean, you, 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 you so I do believe in that. But you, you, you're using the GPL version too. So yeah. if you start a new project, you know, I mean, it was good. But if you do start a desktop yeah. environment or whatever, so what license you would choose and what would be the reason of choosing it? So. I think this is like a personal choice in mm -hmm. that different people just have different opinions on what matters. Mm -hmm. For me, I do want the, I think the GPL version 2, I don't like the language. Mm -hmm. It's much too long and much too complicated. Uh, but I think the basic ideas are really the right ones, mm -hmm. which is basically saying, hey, I give you source code, you have to give me source code back, and you, this is irrevocable, and nobody has any extra rights, and, and it stays stays like that forever. I think that's just wonderful. Mm -hmm. uh, and I picked the GPL version 2 originally because that was what I agreed with, and then the legalese yeah. and all the language, that's less important to me, And but at the same time, it was, I mean, I wanted something that was well known, right. and I still absolutely agree so with that. So I would mean, still, still use GPL version 2, likely. I mean, there are other alternatives. There's the, I don't like the GPL version 3 because it, right. I mean, the, the reasons I don't like it are pretty, uh, yeah. pretty much out there. Mm -hmm. But uh, but I understand people who want to use what it. And if you... I also understand people who want to use BSD. I mean, right, right. there's a lot of... I've seen that uh, when you talk about community project, run project yeah. versus commercial project, they choose license, you know, because they, they want to mix and match. So like Google, you know, they would prefer BSD or MIT license. Or, yeah. You know, so, I mean, it is true that mostly if you're a commer <coughs> commercial entity... You water? No, I'm fine. Um, you tend to go with something like BSD because then... It leaves you more options going forward, mm -hmm. but but that's where I actually think it, it is a mistake right. because it gives you options to do other things going forward, yes, but it also means that 
the community around it does not feel protected because right. they know that everybody has these options to to just take it and go with it mm -hmm. and 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 as a developer mm -hmm. if if i start a project and i give it away i really want people to use it but at the same time i want people to give their improvements back right. and that's that i think is fair mm -hmm. i call it tit for tat mm -hmm. you know, right mm -hmm. and uh, and if somebody else does a project and I want to join that community, I also feel much more protected if that other person chose the GPL because then I feel that any improvements I give back will will be part of this right. continual improvement. Mm -hmm. While if you use a GP, uh, BSD license, <clears throat> I think the community is less protected. Mm -hmm. But this is my personal opinion, and there have been lots of very successful BSD mm -hmm. license projects too. So I don't know. It's um, um, to some degree the license proliferation has mm -hmm. been a huge source of confusion. So, right. so I'd rather stick to like a couple of well-known licenses well and just well say, yeah. okay, everybody know you may not love the GPL version too but at least everybody knows how to deal with it. Right. You may not love the v version three. Again, it's one of a handful of licenses. The new four, uh, uh, the, the shorter version of the BSD license, mm -hmm. everybody knows how that works. Right. It's nice. Mm -hmm. By the time you get outside of those three, now you have to say, okay, which one is it? Is it the Mozilla license? Is it the so-and-so? So, so I'd rather keep things simple. Mm -hmm. And I'd stay with GPL version two just to to avoid complexity. I made the mistake once. Uh, sparse, which is not a very well known project, but I started it for doing statics analysis of the kernel. Mm -hmm. Actually, it started as a kind of compiler front end thing, mm -hmm. and uh, I decided, okay, there are simpler licenses and I made the mistake thanks of of picking I actually forget which license <laughs> I picked. But I picked one of the more modern licenses that wasn't very well known and I was like, okay, this seems to be much simpler than the GPL version two. And it was, but it was not compatible with anything else. Mm -hmm. And and then when you have to work together with people and you always have to explain your license choice and things like that. And we finally got it relicensed. Mm -hmm. okay. Actually, that's, that's many years ago now, but, but it was actually a painful experience to use one of the smaller licenses just because it became such a mm -hmm. like problem working. People wanted to use some of the code from Sparse in other projects. It, and then not it, it was not compatible with yeah. anything else mm -hmm. and it was different enough that you had to always explain it and it was just not worth the pain right. to me. It's so I'd still, I'd still pick GPL version yeah. 2 yeah. just to it, it, It's very clearly tells what you can and cannot yeah. do that period. Uh, now you you mentioned about your personal life, you know that you know it, the next has stayed whatever you know. So so how do you maintain? You work in a bar, still work in a bathroom. H how do you maintain the? You work from home also, right? Yep. So and I work from home, so it's challenging because you're working often. What? How do you maintain the work-life balance? <laughs> well, I mean, part of it, the way I maintain it, and I've I've talked to people who cannot work from home because mm -hmm. they have kids and they just right. say. Um, I can't concentrate. I need to go to the office so that the kids aren't there and they don't disturb me and they don't distract me when I'm working. And coming back to the, I'm not a very nice person. My kids never distracted me or disturbed me when I was working because they... They know. It, it wasn't, I didn't need to teach them, but it was like they realized very quickly that daddy is not a very fun person if you come and scream in his ear when uh -huh. he's working right so then it would never I mean they would never come into the office because mm -hmm. the off it was not that the office door was closed and mm -hmm. it was not that it was like this is this is the border you can't cross there was never any kind of that kind of rule it was more like that's not the fun room okay. <laughs> that's that's daddy's work area and now we have a big house and the kids are big enough that it's not an issue anyway but uh, but I much prefer working from home because it means that uh, I I don't have to plan on working. Mm -hmm. I just so something happens and uh, I just go to the computer. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the time, not during the merge window. So merge windows are special. Merge windows, I just have to be at the computer like 
eight to ten hours a day because that's what it takes. So merge, you do it from home? The merge yeah, I try to. Okay. I, sometimes I do merge windows when I'm traveling and it's really painful. Mm -hmm. uh, but outside of the merge window, a lot of the time it's like I end up waiting for results. People, like, there's a bug discussion that's going on mm -hmm. and it wasn't me who found the bug, it was somebody else and it's being reported. And, and it's really just email and you get emails coming in mm -hmm. especially if it's somebody from Europe or the rest of the, the world hours, yeah. they, they come in at odd hours right so a lot of the time I end up waiting around for people so I I actually read email a lot on my tablet or my phone mm -hmm. and uh, just because then then something comes in and say okay now I go up to my office and now I need to do actual real work in front of a real computer mm -hmm. but I can do the the kind of first order filtering of just seeing what's going on, I can do that on the on, on the phone. So are okay. you like Richard because Richard is one stayed with us in Belgium when we live, so the thing is if he's on the dinner table he will just put his computer on the plate, work on no. it. So, no. so if you don't bring your that, no. oh there's a pull request food aside and just no. start no, no okay. No, 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 I won't do that. It's right. like I'm I want to be there, I mean, when I'm going away for a week and I can't react to pull requests the same day, mm -hmm. I, I let, not everybody know, but I will let the, the top maintainers know, saying, hey, I'm, I'm going to be traveling, I'm going to have so okay. little time that I'm not going to answer like that. Mm -hmm. But I don't, I don't need to feel like the pull request comes in and I will pull five minutes later. Yeah. 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 I so will pull within the next twenty four right. hours. So so when, when when we look at your family, like is it like oh it's strict family time, no no work or no. you you No. I mean part of that was um so my wife is a stay at home mm -hmm. mom, but especially when the kids were small with three different kids in the U.S., you have to drive them to right. anything after school, right? right? So uh, we always had this situation where, okay, my my wife can only be in so many places at the same time. Mm -hmm. So I would uh, I would just know that after school, usually somebody needs to be driven. That's much less of an issue now mm -hmm. because yeah, two other kids yeah. drive themselves and are off to college. Mm -hmm. But but that's kind of the the work life situation I was in. That it wasn't. It wasn't like, okay, dinner time is when the family gets together and then we watch TV afterwards. No. You it watch was, TV? No. <laughs> no. no. Yeah, watching um, Game of Thrones or something, Mr. No, Robot? I don't. My wife watches some TV. Have you ever I, heard of Mr. Robot? No. Oh, okay, that's very good. You know, I've so heard of Game yeah. of Thrones. I've never seen it. I started watching. Uh, mm -hmm. Now, the thing is, uh, your kids are big. They are going to school. Yeah. So you are entering a totally different phase of your life. You know, you will have all the time to yourself. So will you still be doing Linux? Or you'll have, and because now a lot of people are bigger <laughs> than you. So. Uh, actually, that's odd because when I got my first child, at that point, people were like worried. Oh, now he's, I, I know, yeah. he's, he has children and he's moving away from university. They happened about the same time, and 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 some people are saying, "Oh, that's bad." Now, now yeah. he will stop maintaining Linux, and now the children are going away, and you're asking me whether I will stop maintaining. <laughs> no, Linux. I'm not saying you're stop. Uh, yeah. My question is that you have more time now. Um, I don't think it will change a lot. Uh -huh. Right? I mean, it really was. I mean, we've we've had this whole fairly traditional mm -hmm. family style where right. the husband <laughs> brings in the money, even if he does it. In a bathrobe, <laughs> right? and and the wife takes care of the children. Right. So it's actually my wife who's getting impacted a lot more by the fact that the kids are going away. Mm -hmm. But we still have one. She's in high school. I mean, mm -hmm. she will get her driver's license in a couple of months, so mm -hmm. she will be driving herself at that point. How do you emotionally feel you know, that your kids? Like, because I have two kids, a small one. So when you, they grow up, they're going. I'm to so play. happy about it. Right. <laughs> I like. I thought that. Babies are not even very interesting. Children really start getting interesting around the see age of nine. Nice. See something nice. No, no, no. <laughs> no, at the age of nine, mm -hmm. you they change roughly. Right? Mm -hmm. I'm not saying exactly when they turn nine. Uh, before nine, they're they're very immediate. They they don't they don't think really. They react. Mm -hmm. yeah, right. And uh, and at the age of nine roughly they start have abstract thinking mm -hmm. and they start 
they start thinking much more interesting things and they turn into humans right. that's my that's kind of my and 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 i saw that as a huge step forward i mean when when a child turns from something that isn't very smart mm -hmm. right? maybe slightly smarter than a dog right. <laughs> don't get me wrong <laughs> and turns into a real human right. and starts starts thinking at a completely different level mm -hmm. i was very impressed with that and uh and I thought it was very noticeable too. Mm -hmm. And and now, teenage years not always pleasant, mm -hmm. right? You get uh, you get arguments, you get very uh, boyfriends coming home. Uh, not always the happiest moment, right? Uh -huh. But I'm actually really I'm enjoying seeing them turn into adults. Mm -hmm. And again, I think that's the uh, when when you. When you go into a real independent person, mm -hmm. I think that's uh, another big step, and that's happening f right now for them. So, yeah. so I, I'm actually very, I, I think it's I nice think. to see them grow up. Okay. So has there any influence on them? Uh, you as a you know, kind of you know, software person, kind of celebrity uh, guy who's changing the I don't, I don't think so. You're um, right. humble than we know, but you know, I mean, is there any discussion at home with your kids, like with the daughters, about what they want to do or what you're doing, any influence like that? No, no not really. Mm -hmm. I mean, they obviously very much know about the Linux thing, and mm -hmm. uh, they have computers that run Linux, and that's not an option. I mean, this is not something they got t the choice in. Mm -hmm. um, but, for example, uh, my oldest daughter seems to be doing, I mean, she's going to a technical college. Mm -hmm. She will presumably do computer science mm -hmm. and, and engineering. Mm -hmm. We'll see. Mm -hmm. But uh, but it was not something we pushed them into. Okay. We did push them into getting Initially, a real degree, yeah. mm -hmm. right? Okay. We said, we'll pay for college, but it has to be a real job. Mm -hmm. You're not doing a, like right. uh, like some degree where or you don't see yourself with mm -hmm. a real, real career afterwards. Mm -hmm. But it was like, you don't have to be a tech person. I, and I don't think the second one right now is going into pre-med, so okay. she, she's looking at neuroscience. Mm -hmm. The third one says she's interested in being a school teacher, oh, which yeah. my in wife US, used US? to be. What? It's in the US, I am not completely convinced yeah, it's a good know, career, right. but it's. A, I think, Coming from Finland, being a teacher is a really right. very well respected job. So, so I, I'm not complaining. I'm slightly sad that right. in the U.S. they're not very well respected. Actually, we are looking forward to going back to Germany. You know, as the yeah. grades are growing, education yeah. is so expensive, and you know the. Well, that's what we life. thought we would but go to. We thought we'd f move back to Finland when the kids started school. And that's by the time the kids started school, we'd learned how the U.S. <laughs> system works. And then we said, yeah, by the time they go to have to go to college, maybe we'll move back to Finland because mm -hmm. college is free. But it never happened. And even that never yeah. happened. So. It, it's just a private question, not uh, maybe yeah. not. Uh, so what will upset you more? If your daughters bring a uh, boyfriend home or bring an iPad or a Windows machine home? <laughs> Oh, oh no! I mean, the the iPad or Windows machine is much worse. The boyfriends <laughs> have already <laughs> had. It's like you know it's gonna happen. It's all fine. Yeah. It's like whatever. Uh, it's just slightly <laughs> awkward still. I, right? I know I can totally yeah. understand. I mean, I have two boys. I agree with. I have four sisters, so I yeah. totally understand. You know? But in India, it was not a culture of boyfriend and girlfriend right. thing. Uh, uh, I think it's like quite long, but I just you know wrap it up quickly. Is uh, the uh, about security, you know, these mm -hmm. days we hear a lot about security stuff pop up. I talked to mm -hmm. Greg uh, last time and he said, you know, the Linux kernel community, you know, we patch things very quickly, yeah. but mostly what happens is those uh, vendors, you know, they don't push update because there is no mechanism. So what is your opinion about either there are more bugs being discovered or now there are more bugs being introduced? Uh, Quite frankly, uh, part of it, I think, is there's a there's this whole scare culture about security. And we have bugs, don't get me wrong. But to just give an example, mm -hmm. maybe one or two weeks ago, mm -hmm. I mean, fairly recently, yeah, yeah. there was this whole big, I mean, there were tons and tons of articles being written about how 1.4 billion yeah. Android, Android devices device were open to, vulnerable to this networking bug. Right. No. Mm -hmm. Yes, it was a bug. We actually followed the spec a bit too closely, and, early, yeah. right? And 
But from a security angle, the vulnerability was, I mean, it's not, it's more of a, you can do it in the lab, but, not in the real but world. in the real world, it really, really, really doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. But you had tons and tons of security, like, yes, it was a bug, and yes, in theory, 1.4 billion devices were involved, mm -hmm. But no, nobody who actually knew what was going on would ever really care, mm -hmm. right? But then you have these scare, right. scary, scary stories mm -hmm. written about it. And that's why I dislike the security community so much, right. because they try to drum up these stories. Mm -hmm. And we've had, we've had bad security bugs. I mean, we'd had really nasty ones where, where I go, Wow, that's just stupid. Right. I mean, we did that was not good, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And and it, they happen. Um, we try to fix it, but um, more importantly, we are working fairly hard on making hardening infrastructure. Yes. Yeah, so right? what are you doing there? Yeah. The, where where we try to say, okay, bugs will happen, but mm -hmm. when they happen, hopefully, all these other like safety mechanisms mm -hmm. mean that. In practice, they are, they don't end up being security issues okay. or they are so hard to exploit that, okay. that it's not usually a problem, mm -hmm. right? So we do have a very real project going on. It's been... Are you talking CII or something? Uh, like well, it's part of CII. Okay. Uh, so Case Cook <coughs> uh, has been kind of the main person leading it on the kernel side now where he's instrumental in, in integrating code to kind of create these fallback safety nets. So we're working on that. Mm -hmm. Hopefully that will, I mean, we've worked a lot on security issues in general. Mm -hmm. So the supervisor mode, access protection, supervisor mode, execute protection, things where when bugs happen and a user program fools the kernel into jumping or accessing something insecure in an insecure manner, the hardware will actually catch it because we talked to Intel to make sure that they had the hardware acts like mm -hmm. capabilities to do it. Uh, so, so we've done a lot of things like that. Will we ever get it perfect? No, no, no. Yet, right? no. and uh, and it's not just the kernel. I mean, it's the different components. Which there's a mean. yeah. Uh, I mean, I think one of the big wake up calls was was all the open SSL yeah. issues yeah. and and uh, and that it quite often. I mean, the kernel is kind of special when it comes to security. Mm -hmm. but at the same time, the kernel often doesn't. I mean, if you look at the real security issues is often in libraries that mm -hmm. that are used in all the applications that then try to do something secure and, and when the libraries fail yeah right so so we're we're working on it i will not say that we will ever be perfect we're working, working on being better but you're doing it at the kernel level yeah but then yeah. you look at the distributions you know even commercial distribution you yeah. know, they, i mean the patches that you make don't even reach the devices so what that's kind of that's an, that's a bigger problem in the IoT space, or okay. well, in the I wouldn't say IoT because IoT is, is it's not so commercially viable yet. Yeah. But but uh, looking at, for example, the just mobile phones, right. some of them never get updated, right. Right. and it's is it annoying? Yes, yeah. uh, and it's part it, that is part of why we're trying to do the hardening thing yeah. so yeah. that. Even when you don't update, hopefully, it won't be catastrophic. Right? right? Uh, it's it's a hard, hard problem to right. do. Right. I mean, the the good news is a lot of people are doing security on many different levels, which is the only way to really do it right in the first place. Is yes, we do the best we can do in the kernel, but then distributions are trying to. I mean, people are moving on into using containers to kind of also limit or virtualization to right. limit right. when security problems happen it limits it to, to to a smaller part of the system and things like that and using like 
things like virtual machines, not in the not in the virtualization sense, right. but in the Java virtual machine kind of sense also. And so you add all these kinds of different layers and hopefully that, the mitigator, the that, that just makes it more and more inconvenient because you have to punch through all of the layers right. to get to the really serious bugs. But I have to say, some of those attack people are pretty smart people and, oh, yeah, yeah. and uh, clearly they're not all criminals. Some of them work for the government. Right. Oh, yeah. And there are so many, you know, they're always looking yeah. for something, so it's yeah. very hard to just find all the holes in that. And it's a very different, I mean, part of the issue is that people who are developers, we're looking at giving access to new features and just giving access to hardware and things like that. And, and we have a completely different mindset from the kind of people who are looking at attack services. Right. So, so sometimes it's like you, you read about an exploit and you say, wow, I would never have thought about that mm -hmm. because you come from a different right. direction in, in, in the hall. In the yeah, it's like you're inside a fort, you know, watching, guarding three doors, but there are yeah. people around the wall, you know, just looking um, for small looking holes. Looking for yeah. small holes, yeah. Yeah, you know. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, one last, you know, interesting question is: uh, people always ask, you know, what is yeah. users using and what dist uh, uh, dist not distribution, but desktop environment you're using? I tend to try to not care that much about my distro, mm -hmm. but w what I don't want to have is I have three different distributions that look different. So, mm -hmm. because I put the same thing on my wife's machine, my desktop, my laptop, my kids' machines. Mm -hmm. uh, so for the last probably 10 years, probably since I switched away from PowerPC, mm -hmm. I think I've used Fedora okay. since. So, so right now, most of the machines are Fedora 23. A couple of them have been updated to 24. But then I install my own car. Actually, I have to say, Fedora, one of the reasons I like Fedora is that they tend to be fairly good about new kernels right, right. and they've also been very Red Hat has in general been good about kernel resources and, and just they've had, they've been helpful in testing and obviously they do have a lot of kernel engineers so, so that's one of the reasons I ended up going with Fedora was just that hey, I felt that they did a good job on the side I cared about uh, now, uh, when I, I mean, you are a developer, you know, I mean, you are a totally different kind of person. Your needs with the computer is different than my needs or, you know, your yeah. wife's needs. Uh, desktop Linux has not happened the way, but Chrome is doing wonders now, Android mm -hmm. apps are coming. So do you think uh, this is the droid kind of, this is the desktop you're looking for or not yet? Or? It's not the desktop I'm looking for. Not but you, but Linux, but, you know, when you are. But I, I think it, yes, I think it's one of the desktops where I, if you're just looking at, things from an end user standpoint i think these days it actually makes sense mm -hmm. to see mainly the browser not just the browser but the browser is clearly right. like a big portion of the system and then then chrome mm -hmm. yes. kind of takes that as the starting point and right. says okay we want you to give the, the browser experience and then we have some other small things mm -hmm. on top but it's not so i and i think that's probably I mean, I'm actually, there's a lot of people who seem to really like Chrome as a, as a desk, yeah, like I, a desktop I, I just because they don't have to worry about kind of a traditional, and yeah. And with, with Android apps, because I have Chrome yeah. uh, Pixel, so Android apps are there, so I yeah. can use Microsoft Word. And oh, Android. so you actually use the Android apps on Chrome. Yeah, I yeah. Haven't, I've never used yeah, that. Yeah, you can run a Skype, you can yeah. use Microsoft Office, I can yeah. use Photoshop, Lightroom, everything, it, and everything goes in the container. Yeah. So when I look at Linux desktop, so it's just like flying cars, you know, in old days. Yeah. So if they we ever get flying, it won't be the same. No, we no, no, I, I agree. I, I, I think right now it looks like Chrome is really taking the Linux desktop and making it happen. And and the thing I use is, totally I'm it's yeah. the old workstation environment, right, and right. that's that's fine. I mean, that's doing really well too. It's way better than the older workstation environment right, used right. to be. So so yeah, no, I. Um, I mean, I'll just give an analogy of car, you know, the car you need as an engineer or whatever, it won't yeah. be the same car that, you know, that, that most, else, people most people use. drive. So. No, no, and I, I actually think that's uh, another sign of, of, okay, the market has become more stable. I don't know if stable is the, I mean, mature, it, it is stable. more mature in the sense that if you looked at why the PC made such a huge difference in, 
in the 80s and 90s. It was because the PC finally made like a unified platform that could do everything, a bit of everything, everything, right? everything right? And before that, you didn't have no. that, right? And and that's why the PC really changed the world. That's why even right. browser, you can do everything in a browser now. Right, but but it, but it also is the fact that back when the PC changed the world, you really needed something that could do a bit of everything, everything. because you didn't know what you would, need. You yeah. would need, right? And and there was a lot of development in many different areas. And and what's happened in the last five to ten years is that people have started knowing what they need. It, on a desktop, you need a browser, you need a maybe a word processor, although you can do that too right. in a browser right. if you want to. And and there's not a lot of development going on, so now you can make specialized devices again, mm -hmm. right? And the cell phones took a bit longer, but They're they good. clearly matured too, so in the last two years, yeah. not a lot has really changed right. in cell phones. So now you kind of know where the goalposts is, and you don't need the original kind of PC that could do a bit of everything right. anymore. Uh, so, so I think that's just the market has changed, and 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 what I thought of as a desktop, right, yeah. was the general purpose PC that doesn't necessarily make sense anymore, anymore economically in in the, uh, where we are now, except I mean, yeah. as a workstation. Yeah, I mean, a lot of people. I mean, yeah. I, what I've also seen is that everybody almost has a laptop. Yeah. But they spend most of their time on mobile. They have, like, they still have it for those things. But most of the time, they, so today yeah. actually they have more devices yeah. than actually really. They well, a lot them. of people. I actually, I don't think everybody has a lot. Not everybody. Anymore. I think most people it's who need, you know. Yeah. No. Like if you go to a conference like this, you will have. Yeah, a I need this stuff for my work, you know. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. Or yeah. Whatever. Then I do most of my work. There's a lot of people who are right. who don't really need that anymore yeah. and, and are perfectly happy doing, I mean, doing lots on their phones and right. maybe on a tablet, right? So can we say that the, the, the year of desktop is here with the Chrome or is still you're waiting for the I, desktop? I, I think yes, maybe, that Chrome is basically the Linux desktop. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, I clearly that whole has, thing has not played out completely yet, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So give it a, maybe five more years and see where, where things are. Okay. But yes, I, I do think that we may be in a situation where where Chromebooks are just... That's the desktop for people who don't do development. Right. That's fine. Right. Uh, so how was that uh, interview? I, as I said again, I wish I had it in video format, but yeah, you know, we'll do it next time. So once again, thanks for watching and see you next time. Bye for now.